today, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. We're back here again in, in Denver. And the epistle for this sixth Sunday was taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6. Brethren, all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death. We are buried together with him by baptism unto death. That as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, and that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is justified from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ, knowing that Christ risen, rising for again from the dead, dieth now no more. Death shall no more have dominion over him. For in that he died to sin, he died once. But in he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel, taking that according to St. Mark chapter 8. At that time when there was a great multitude with Jesus, and, and, with, with, and had nothing to eat, Calling to his disciples together, he saith to them, I have compassion on the multitude, for behold, they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I shall send them away fasting to their home, they will faint in the way, for some of them came from afar off. And his disciples answered him, From whence can any one fill them with here with bread in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? Who said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And taking the seven loaves, giving thanks, he broke, and he gave to the disciples to set them before them. And they set them before the people. And they then had, they had a few little fishes. And he blessed them and commanded them to be set before them. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up that which was left of the fragments, seven baskets, and they had that had taken had eaten were for about four thousand, and they sent them away. Those were the words of today's holy gospel. Amen. 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 So, a few considerations: Sixth Sunday. First of all, concerning the four thousand, briefly, the Lord is beginning to teach his apostles one of the obligations of the church. And it is from the very beginning of the church, we have the church does uh, give to the poor and take and take care of physical needs from the very beginning. So the, the, the church uh, is the one that opened the corporal works of mercy, and the priests are obliged to take care of that. So that when someone comes before the priest, he says to the disciples, they've been with me for three days. They've been out of the desert, for three days with me, I cannot send them away fasting. They will faint in the way. And the apostles respond, how can we take care of them in the wilderness? Now when we, when we consider the life of the saints and the life of the church down 2,000 years, we note that whenever there is a feeding that comes from the priest, it is meant to come in the wilderness. You know that when, a child, when someone is... Uh, dying on, on the battlefield, and the man is near death, he always calls upon the help of his mother. The last one to call for when he's died is his mother. But what about in the wilderness? When a man is in the wilderness and he is hungry, he must call, there's no food around, he calls upon God. He calls upon God to give him food in the wilderness. Now remember that every day for 40 years, the Jews followed Moses. And they followed him in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, Moses fed them. Moses made sure that they were fed with physical food in the wilderness. And so there's, whenever there is wilderness, whenever there is no means of sustenance, whenever there's no way of getting what we need, people turn to the church. People turn to the priest, and God says that that's what they're supposed to do. We are, we're, how are we going to get food in the wilderness? And then the, the apostles then say, but we are in the wilderness. They said that the, to our Lord Jesus Christ, 
We are in the wilderness. How are we going to feed these people from this wilderness? And here we see there are two sides of the practical duty of the priest. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And when you go into a village, you eat what they set before you. you don't go from house to house. The laborer is worthy of his hire. People are supposed to give money to the priests. People are supposed to feed the priest. They're supposed to take care of the church. This is one of their duties and obligations. But what about the church? Many say the church is only responsible for the spiritual food. You give the priest the physical food, and he provides the spiritual food. But when we're in the wilderness, it is not the duty of the priest only to give spiritual food, but also the material food. Now we're in the wilderness, and our Lord says to the disciples this time, how much bread do you have? We have seven loaves. If you go back to the Old Testament, you will find that in the, in the temple, there had to always be seven loaves of proposition on the table, and this was a seven, these were seven loaves that were designed for the priests. We also go back to the Old Testament, and we find that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, speaks of David, and David has the heart of Christ. Now, David was one day hungry, and David had nothing to eat, and so he went into the temple, and he took the bread and the grain that was before the priests, and he ate it. So he's letting his apostles know, you cannot say that though the, the priest is a laborer, and he is worthy of his labor, and the people are supposed to give money to Padre, and the people are supposed to give food to Padre, and the people are supposed to take care of Padre. When the people do this, they are doing this because it's their duty towards God to tithe. And since they can't take food and give it directly to God, they give it to God by giving it to the priest. And when the people do this, they can't give money directly to God, so they give it to God by giving it to the priests. Therefore, the people are fulfilling their duty towards God and by giving money and food to the priest. But what about the priest? In the Old Testament, the priest ate of those seven loaves. In the New but in the New Testament, the priest shall, uh, must not only eat of the seven loaves, he must take the seven loaves. There were the seven loaves on the table of proposition. And these seven loaves were taken by the priest. You, how much do you have? We have seven loaves. That's exactly how many loaves were on the table on the north side of the, of the temple. The seven loaves. We're going to take seven loaves and we're going to feed them to the people. So you take these seven loaves and let them be blessed. And there are a few little fishes and it will give them to the people. So that charity is one of the obligations of the church. And it is not only an obligation of the faithful who are obliged to, to give to the poor as well as to the church. But it's an obligation also of the priests from the very beginning. He blesses and feeds from the wilderness. That when there is wilderness... The priest must say that we are in the wilderness. Now we'll find a way to feed in the wilderness. When we go to the lives of the saints, many times in the lives of the saints, all over the lives of the saints, we find that there is a feeding of the of the soul in the wilderness. <coughs> when there is a, when, when the family is starving, when they don't have the things they need, the priest comes and blesses. Elias, for instance, he blessed the porridge. He blessed the porridge, that was, and that porridge was then multiplied, and it made the, the women of Sarepta able to survive, so that there will be food blessed in the wilderness. Now take this food and give it to the people. Also, the priest must make sure that he is attentive not only to the supernatural things, but to the natural things, not only to the spiritual things, but to the things of the table, so that when our Lord Jesus Christ came down to St. Martha, when Martha died, our Lord Jesus Christ came to Martha when she was dying, and our Lord Jesus Christ came to her wearing an apron. And our Lord Jesus Christ said to Martha, Martha, when I was on this earth, you fed me at your table. Behold, now I take you to my table, and I have prepared a feast for you in heaven. And the Lord, with an apron, dressed as a waiter, took our Saint Martha and brought her up to the table of the Lord. So that there must be not only a spiritual feeding, but also a material feeding. Also here, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ teaches that we must have confidence in God. Give us this day our daily bread. That if we follow Christ in the desert, he will provide. He also instructed his apostles, when you go from one place to another, don't worry about what you shall eat. I told the faithful, don't worry what they shall eat, what they shall drink, what they shall feed on. God will take care of them. 
But the priest was not only worried about what he should eat, what he should drink, what he should put on. He said, don't worry about those of the flock also. For God will provide. Come how he will be able to feed from the wilderness. And so, from the seven loaves, he taught them to feed the, 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 the people in the wilderness. You teach them the truth. You give them the faith. But be attentive to their needs. Hence, we have a custom, for instance, in our prayers, that we not only pray to the saints to become saints, we only pray to the saints in order to help us grow in virtue. But we pray to, but we pray to them for food. We pray to them to find our keys. We pray to them to take care of us in material things as well as spiritual, so that we are not only uh, uh, beholding to God for that which is spiritual, but also that which is material. Hence, we have the St. Anthony's table. We take the St. Anthony's bread and the St. Joseph table. And we have the custom of always giving that which we have to the poor. And that there must be a giving to the poor. And the priest also has an obligation to give to the poor. So that not only do the faithful must the faithful give to the poor, but the priest must also give to the poor. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he raised people from the dead. He provided them with the, with the means of, he brought, provided them with the, the curing of their sicknesses. He, he, he provided them with food in the desert. He took care of their material needs. When there was a great storm, he stopped the storm. And he, of course, was and Saint, he was he did not only spiritual things but also material things, and hence he teaches this in the five thousand, teaches the four thousand. And then, secondly, a second consideration, very briefly, concerning the scripture reading in the in the in the in the, in the mass of this of the bravery of this sixth Sunday after Pentecost, for Saint Augustine or Saint Gregory the Great speak about the story of David. David had sinned with Bathsheba and committed adultery. David had sent Urias off to, uh, to die. David murdered Urias. And he told, he told Joab, send Urias in battle. <clears throat> Urias, and then uh, let, let the Ammonites kill him. And then I will take Bathsheba to wife. And no one will know that he has done wrong. This is a terrible sin of David. St. Augustine says, consider David the king. And why is it that God loves David so much? Because David, who is an important man, David, who is the head of the church, David, who was a king, David, who had done great things in his life, he had killed Goliath. He had conquered the enemies of God. He had to fight to bring his kingdom to power. He was a very powerful and important man. But what made David great, says St. Augustine? What made him great is that no matter how sacred and important he was, he always accepted correction. And he very humbly and immediately repented of every sin. This is why God said to David, this heart is my heart, his heart is my heart. So Nathan came to David in the gospel, in the scripture reading today. And Nathan came to David and said, David, I have a problem of a man that owns sheep, a very wealthy man that owns sheep. And another man who was very poor and had only one sheep. And that sheep used to sleep in his bosom. And he loved that sheep. And one day the rich man had a feast. And he didn't want to kill any of his sheep for the feast. So he went to the poor man that was his neighbor and he grabbed the only sheep that he had, took it from his bosom, and he killed the sheep, and he used that for the feast. What should we do? And David became exceedingly angry. And he said, that man is most wicked. That man is terrible. And therefore he will pay back fourfold, and he will receive a great punishment. And Nathan said, you are that man, David. For God gave you all the things you need. And he gave you all the wives, and he gave you all the things you need. And if it's not enough for you, ask, and God will give you more. Hmm? Yeah, you are not satisfied with what God gave you. You are not satisfied with your wives. You are not satisfied with your kingdom. You are not satisfied with your victories. You're not satisfied with what God gave you. But well, Urias had only one wife, and he loved her with a perfect love. And you went and stole that wife. And then you killed Urias by the hand of Ammon, and you think that you are innocent? Now, St. Augustine or St. Gregory, whichever one it is, writes a sermon today. He says, notice the reaction of David. A king who had fought great battles, the representative of God himself, the one who was sung about, who said, 
they, when they sung about him, Saul killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Immediately, David wept. Immediately, David said, I have sinned and done the horrible thing by the, before the Lord, and I am most sorry. Nathan said immediately to David, God has already forgiven you for murdering Uriah or the sin with Bathsheba because of the heart of David. But because you have committed this sin, there shall be a punishment. Now here is one of the places in sacred scripture where it is very clear against the heresy of the Protestants and many souls that there is a difference between forgiveness and the payment of the debt. That there are two parts of a sin. The first part of the sin is my evil will. David had a most evil will and he was filled with pride and filled with wickedness when he committed the impurity, the adultery of Bathsheba. And he was most wicked when he sent Urias to be murdered and tried to make it look like he, he, no one would find out that he had murdered Urias. He came out smelling like a rose and being so innocent and he was very proud of himself. It was a most wicked, malicious sin of the heart. But as soon as Nathan said to him, Nathan said to him, David, you're the one that murdered, like that man of the sheep. You're the man, the rich man. You're the one that wasn't satisfied. David repented. And Nathan said immediately, David, you are forgiven. Now, according to modern men and the Protestants, that means it's finished. Jesus has forgiven me. I have committed sins, and the Lord Jesus has forgiven me, and now I can go straight to heaven. That is not what Nathan says. Nathan says, you are forgiven. And you will not be punished in hell for this sin. But because you have sinned, the sword shall not go out of your house. And now I'm going to tell you what is your punishment, David. You secretly took a woman and you committed adultery with her. But I, God, will make someone take your wives and it shall not be a secret or there shall be adultery committed with them and it shall be in the sun. And so it was multiple years later that Absalom committed adultery with the wives of David, incestual adultery. And he did it in a tent upon the top of the city that all of Israel might know. And on that day, Nathan said two things. Your sin is forgiven, but there must be a debt paid. The debt must be paid, and it will be paid. For the sword will not go out of your house. There will be death in your house. Your children shall be cursed. Roboam is going to go to hell. He will be a wicked son, grandson. Solomon shall begin good, but then Solomon shall turn against God. The sword shall not exit from your house. And your wives shall be taken, and they shall the adultery shall be committed with them. You did your sin in secret, but this sin shall be done in public, that all Israel might know. There is a difference between the forgiveness of sin and the punishment. From this we know that there must be a purgatory, and there must be a payment of debt. And there, it is not enough to say, I am sorry for my sins. There is no one going to have a more perfect sorrow than David, a greater heart than David, and yet David had to experience the punishment. Later on, David would sin again by pride. And God came to David, Nathan came to David again, and he said, David, you have sinned. Why are you counting your kingdom as if it's your kingdom when it is my kingdom? Therefore, you shall receive a punishment. Now you have three choices. One punishment shall last only three days. Another three months, another three years. The punishment of three years shall be the most mild punishment. The punishment of three months shall be a less mild punishment, and the most severe punishment shall last three days. Which one do you want? Well, you shall be punished. And there came a great plague. I think he chose the middle one. I can't remember which one he chose. I believe it was the middle one. He chose the one in the middle. And it came a great plague to kill one-third of Israel. Because David sinned. And David was forgiven, but there had to be a payment. It is very clear in the gospel, very clear in justice, very clear in God, that there must be a payment for sin. And so David committed the sin, and there's a payment. So likewise, when we commit sins, there is not only the forgiveness of sins by which we can go to heaven, but there must be a payment. Hence, the church, in order to facilitate our payments in this life, tells us to do penance for our sins by making sacrifices, 
tells us to say prayers which the church attaches indulgences which reduce the purgatory time and punishment due to sin. And then if we have not done enough when we die, we, our souls are saved, but we must go to the fires of purgatory and the payment must be made. David committed sin, David was forgiven, and David had to make payments. And so David then listened to the word, and also, also he mentioned another punishment. You love this child. This child must die. The child that is born in adultery, the child that Bathsheba has conceived, this child must die. You shall receive a great love of this child. You shall beg for the child's life, and your prayer shall not be heard. And the child shall die. And so the child was born, and David prayed for the life of the child, and David wept, and David did penance, and David fasted, and David would not eat, and the child lived eight days. And David also shows the perfection of his heart. When David says, kill me rather than my child, for I am the one that committed a sin. Well, the child remained very sick, and finally on the eighth day, the child died. The servants would not come to David. And David saw the servants that they were at a distance and wouldn't come to him. And he asked, is the child dead? And they said, yes, the child is dead. And David rose up. He took off his sackcloth and ashes. He went and put on the vestments of the king. He sat at the table and he ate food and brought back his strength. He went to the temple of God, and he adored. And the servants said to him, When the child was alive, you prayed that the child might continue to live, and you fasted, and now the child is dead, and you aren't fasting anymore. And now the child is dead, and you have sat and ate. Why are you doing this? What kind of man are you? And David turned to his servants, and he said, while the child was alive, it was expedient for me to pray that the child might live. But now the child is dead. If I continue to pray, shall this child come to life and come to me? Or shall I go to the child and die? Therefore, I worship what God has decided. Hence, Bishop Sheen points out, quoting St. Augustine, we see here in the final part of the punishment of David, that there is prayer and there is adoration. David wept for his sin. David was forgiven. David had to pay a punishment. David prayed for mitigation of his punishment. And some of the punishments were mitigated and some were not. And then David didn't understand the ways of God. And when God showed definitively his ways, David adored. David always did the right thing with his heart. He committed so many sins. He had so many weaknesses but he always did the right thing with his heart. How do we react when we don't hear our prayers answered? All our prayers are answered. This not, answer is not always yes. We adore and accept the answer of God. And so David, and there's this, the David and the mystery of David is read about in the sacred scripture today, where David committed the sin of murdering Bathsheba, but the Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, and the child who was conceived in adultery was punished by God. And David was forgiven by God, but there must still be a cleaning of the punishment. And David accepted the punishment. Therefore, when David died, he died with a perfectly clean heart. He died with a perfect love. He died in absolute perfect purity and chastity. And he died with a cleanness that no other saint has of the Old Testament. And he was ready to go straight to heaven. And he was held back only because the gates of heaven were closed, and he had to wait for the day when Christ would come. So let us consider the transformation of David's heart, and our hearts must transfer, transform like his, and hence, how do we do that? Read the Holy Psalms. Sing the Holy Psalms that our Holy Mother Church sings, 150 hymns that come from the heart of David, which are the heart of our church. In Psalm 50, he weeps for his sin of murdering Urias. He weeps for his sin of adultery, his sin that caused the death of his child, his sin that caused a sword to enter into his kingdom. And this sin, we, we, we this psalm, we repeat part of it in the, in the asparagus every Sunday at Mass. I drink with Heisman, and I shall be cleansed. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. And this is part of the miserere, the hymn of, of David. 
In any case, a few considerations there in the sacred scripture reading. I conclude and I'm opposed to that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.